As I mentioned here this morning, and if you were here at 9.30, you know we have a guest speaker here today, Dr. Doug Hammond. And uh, known of uh, Lehigh Valley Baptist Church, where he pastored, and then, of course, now he's uh, one of their, uh, their missionaries sent out. And it's, been a, it's a missions-minded church. They actually had six uh, guys that came over to Korea with us here and uh, were just a tremendous blessing. And it's really, uh, I know a church is very involved in missions and has had a burden for missions for many years. I think it came a lot from our pastor who really was excited about this subject, and uh, we ought to be excited about it, too. We, we are striving to be a missions-minded church here because the world needs the gospel. The Bible says that we are commanded to bring it to every creature as we, we see in our bulletin, and that uh, we want to be a, as much as possible and be part of something, I think, that's much bigger than ourselves, and that's getting that message that redeems the, the lives and the souls of mankind, that message of salvation, that Jesus Christ provides. And today, if you have been saved, it's been because somebody somewhere down the line got a vision for missions. You wanted to make sure that the people got that message of how they can know for sure that when they die that they're going to heaven, and how they can have their sins forgiven for all eternity. You know, that's a great message. I'm thankful that somebody had a vision, had a mission-mindedness to give that message to me over 15, 16 years ago. And uh, we want to have that same vision as well, whether it's here in our own local Jerusalem, if you will, or to the regions beyond. We want to do everything that we can within our power to make sure that, that those who have not heard, who have not had that opportunity, will hear that message. It's a life-changing message. We heard the testimonies during 9.30. It's amazing how the gospel changes the hearts of people. Puts marriages back together. Gets people off their off their drugs and off their alcohol and off the junk that, that's weighing them down and destroying their lives. And I tell you something, that's the kind of message we, we want to give out to people that makes a difference. So I want you to have your hearts open and, and, and uh, let God speak to them as uh, Brother Hammond here brings the message. So Brother Hammond, why don't you come and show us what God has done uh, your heart. Okay. Thank you very much. It's good to be here with you again uh, this hour as well. And like I said in the early hour, I, I was looking forward to being here and being part of this. And of course, been reading your, your letters as your pastor puts them out, tells us about what's going on. And, and uh, so been praying for you and looking forward to what God's going to do and what he's already done thus far. So uh, I am excited about what God has done in the city and praying God's going to give you a building one day and uh, kind of a house that you can kind of base out of. I know what it's like to come in in the morning like this and you've got just a small slot of time, get it all set up, and then of course we got to get done in time, tear it all down and get back out again. Uh, started a number of churches in the early days and, and so we've kind of gone through that. I, my, my journey, if you will, in life is kind of, well, I don't know, it's... It, it's a little different at times, but I think God brings people and fits people for a purpose. And when I was raised, I was raised in a, a denominational church, um, a Roman Catholic, that's where I was raised, and intended to be a priest. That was my goal in life as a young man. And when I was 13 years old, my dad was killed. And uh, it was an accident in the oil field, and, and so he lost his life. And all of a sudden, I became a fatherless young man with uh, nobody giving me direction. And I, I was really, you know, footless at that point, not quite sure which way to go and what to do. I remember going to the priest, and I remember asking at that time about my father, where he is, how do I know where he is, how can I, how can I know that he's okay? And the priest wasn't able to give me any answers. The best he could give me was basically, he said, look, uh, you and your family need to give me money. You give me money. We will pray for him. We'll get him out of purgatory and into heaven. That's the best hope you've got. And uh, and I remember hearing that, and to me it was such a hollow answer. Number one, he couldn't show me anything from the Bible. And number two, here he is with a family that's just lost the breadwinner, and we have nothing, and he's trying to get money out of us. And that just really set me back. And for my teen years... Uh, I spent my life pretty much angry at God, angry at the Catholic Church, certainly in church in general, and just felt like, obviously, God's a bully. Why would God take my dad? What kind of God is this? And what kind of church is it that they can't help people at a time like this? And so that's kind of the chip on my shoulder that I had growing up. But I had a, I had a friend in, in school, junior high, high school, 
uh, we moved to another town when my dad was killed, and so we, this fellow I met, and he was always inviting me out to a Baptist church. Now, I wasn't about to go to a Baptist church. I don't know how you were raised, but I was raised to believe the Baptists are, you know, right next door to the devil's house. And, uh, you know, you don't want to do that. That was just how I was raised. We had a Baptist young man on, on our street when I was growing up and in grade school years. And, and I was told, now, you can go down and talk to him. You can be nice to him. Don't get too close. You know, those Baptist people, they're, they're a little weird. And... Uh, you know what, now that I am one, I, I have to agree. Uh, Baptists are a little weird, amen. But anyway, uh, so what we ended up doing was just kind of keeping the Baptists at arm's length. But this friend of mine kept after me. And so the year I was graduating from high school, uh, he comes to me and says, Look, Doug, I need your help. I'm trying to win this Bible. They're giving away this nice Bible. I need this Bible. And if I get enough people to visit the church services, I'll, I'll be able to win a Bible. So I said, All right. Tony, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go with you one time. You get off my back, leave me alone. I'll go one time. That's it. So I went to church, and I got there, and I was, I was put off, let me just tell you. The people talked to you. They, the preacher said things that made people laugh, and people actually laughed in church. And, I mean, to me, okay, growing up Roman Catholic, this is not what church is all about. You sit there. You look straight ahead. You keep quiet. It's not a place to laugh. It's not a place to joke. It's certainly not a place to greet people. You want to greet people, you go outside and say hello. You don't do it in the church. I mean, this is just how I was raised. And it's like, what is wrong with these people? But there was something that the preacher kept saying that he kept talking about Christ and knowing God and having a relationship with Him. He, this was the key. Knowing when you die, you're going to heaven. And it caught my attention. Am I doing that by... Uh, Getting up too close, Brother Worker? You don't know? Okay, all right. I think I'm safe. Anyway, hopefully nothing blows up here. Um, but I, it caught my attention. And so there was this tug of war that started in me. There was a part of me that wanted to be there to hear what this man had to say. There was another part of me that was repulsed because this religion stuff, especially these Baptists, is so foreign to me. Honestly, I sat in the very back seat. And I was, I was anticipating the fact that probably the ceiling would fall in on me. You know, you hear people say that. I honestly believe somehow God was going to judge me for even attending this place. And uh, and that kind of odd? Angry at the Catholic Church, and yet at the same time, steeped with this, this uh, superstition that somehow there's going to be problems with it all. Well, long story short, I ended up coming to Christ and getting saved. My life was changed. And I remember sitting in church. And uh, just shortly after I'd gotten saved, the preacher got up, and the preacher started preaching about a thing called tithing. Tithing. And I thought, here we go. Now, when I got saved, you see, one of the things I said was, if it's in the Bible, if, if somebody can show me in the Bible anything, I don't care what it is, if it's in the Bible, I'll believe it. If it's, if it's not in the Bible, then I'm not going to believe it. And I didn't trust anybody. I didn't trust the Catholic Church, didn't trust the priest, and I sure wasn't going to treat, trust a, a, a preacher. Uh, they called himself a Baptist preacher. I wasn't going to trust him at all. And especially when he started saying I had to tithe. Starts talking about 10% of my money. And it's just like, whoa, this can't be. So what I ended up doing was I, I headed home, and I got out a dictionary, and I said, I'll look it up in the dictionary because I know this guy's lying to me. And I looked it up in the dictionary, and the dictionary, wouldn't you believe it, must have been written by Baptists. It agreed with that Baptist preacher. So I said, i got to do some more looking up. And I looked up in another, in an encyclopedia, and I started going through and trying to do some, some study on my own. And everything I did, I came up blank with nobody backing up my position that tithing is tipping. And uh, so I ended up having to say, all right, it's in the Bible, 10% of my income, this is going to be tough. And here I was all of a sudden having to give 10% of my income to the Lord. And uh, it was hard. I swallowed hard. But I did what God wanted me to do. And shortly thereafter, I heard about missions. And I didn't understand about missions. Didn't know much about it. But I knew from what they taught at the church, that's money that you give above and beyond. After the tithe, then you start giving missions. And I thought, whoa, that, they're after more money here. And, um, but the more I looked at my Bible, the more I realized, indeed, missions is what we ought to be involved in. And that was my first introduction. And from there, I got involved in missions, and I've been involved in missions ever since. And been saved now for, boy, uh, since 1971. Anyway, whatever that is, you can figure that out, okay? And uh, 
been involved in missions ever since. And in the churches that I'd start, one of the first things we'd ever do would be we'd start giving to missions. And I had a number of preachers that tell me, Doug, what are you doing? You're starting a church. You can't afford to have a missions program in that church. You need to make sure they pay you first. No, 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 no. We take care of missions first, and then we'll let God take care of the rest. And indeed, we saw we saw our works grow. God took care of us and all the rest. And whatever a church does on that is their business. But at the end of the day, I just felt like we really need to be outreaching the world. And it's not just about us four and no more. We need to be reaching those that are outside the doors. And when I went to Lehigh at Lehigh Valley Baptist Church there in Pennsylvania, when I went there, they were given $35,000 a year in missions. When I left there 23 years later, they were given $275,000 in missions. Talk about a big change. Now, why did that all happen? I'll tell you why. It happened because of one Bible verse that we're going to look at here this morning. This is the verse that changed my life. This is the verse that caught my attention, that grabbed my heart. This is the verse that still captures my heart and still speaks to me. Now, you can rest easy. If you think I'm here to talk about money, I'm not here to talk about money. If, you, if you'd ever sat under my ministry, you'd know I don't talk about money. I mean, hardly ever do I talk about money. I'm just not much on money preaching. I preach on life preaching. I say, look, you know what the best thing we could ever do is when the offering plate comes by, forget the money. Just step in the plate yourself. If you get in the plate, guess what's going to happen? Everything else gets in there. If you get in the plate, God will be able to do with you what He wants to do. And if you let God do with you what He wants to do, everything else will be taken care of. He'll take care of giving you the direction on all the rest. And that's just kind of how I've lived my ministry, lived my life ever since I've gotten saved, is, is with the attitude, I belong to Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that every step I've ever taken I've been excited about. Sometimes I've kind of looked at it like a calf looking at a new gate, you know, and saying, I don't quite know if I want to go through this thing. And had to, had to be herded in by the Lord just a little bit to get me to step on through. But I've always found that God's will and God's way is always best. Look here in the book of Mark, chapter number 16. It's the verse, the passage that your pastor just read this morning. And in Mark 16, verse number 15, this is uh, one of the instances of the Great Commission that's given. This is what a church is all about. This is what a local church is all about. This is what your church is all about. This is what every church I've ever started is all about. This is what our church is in, in Botswana and, and what we're going to be starting in South Africa. This is what they're about. This is what Lehigh was about over in, in Pennsylvania and still is about. This is what we're all about. Mark 16, verse 15. And he said unto them, Who's he? He said, Who's he? Jesus. Jesus Christ. Now, does it matter who's talking to you? <laughs> you better believe it. If somebody's telling me something to do, I want to make sure I know who it is. I want to make sure they've got the authority to say whatever they're going to say to me. I'm not going to listen to just anybody. Somebody stands out in the middle of the road and kind of holds up their hand and says, Stop. I'm not necessarily going to stop. In Africa, that could be very dangerous. It could be thieves, criminals who are getting ready to to steal your car and maybe do worse to you as well. And so you go right on through those. Now, on the other hand, if it's a real policeman, you better stop. But the problem over there is they don't always dress like policemen and you don't always know who's who. I had a guy one time come up to me. I was sitting in my car in a, at a parking lot and he comes up to me and he said, I want to know why your license is not on the car. And I looked up at him and I said, well, I thought I'd just throw it away. And, uh, you know, I thought he was just some guy walking up, you know, yanking my chain. And he said, Mister, you could be in big trouble not having a license on your car. I said, yeah, I sure could, couldn't I? And, uh, and little did I know, he, he's going to tell me he's a policeman. I'm a policeman. Yeah, sure. I said, do you know who I am? He said, no. I said, I'm the President of the United States. And... Uh, and he looked at me. Now, you got to understand me a little bit, all right? I, I like to have a good time once in a while. And, and, the, and the guy, he was dressed like, like a beggar, okay? I mean, he didn't look like anybody of any importance to me. And so he's, I'm a policeman. Yeah, right. I said, I'm, I'm the President of the United States. And he looked at me, you don't believe me, do you? I said, no, I don't believe you. He said, let me show you. He pulls the wallet out. Pulls out his card and he hands it to me. And I look at this little card that's been printed on printer. And I say, anybody could print one of those. How do I know you're really a policeman? He said, I am a policeman. 
I said, oh, and you're telling me my license isn't on the car? No, your license isn't on the car. Oh, well, let's go look. And I got out and I went around. Sure enough, my license had evidently fallen off my car. And uh, he was really a policeman. And he was real nice about it. He figured he was dealing with some dumb American. And so you got to kind of give us a little extra grace, you know. And I appreciated that very much. But anyhow, it, it matters who's talking to you. He said unto them, this is Jesus. And when Jesus talks, you and I ought to listen. He's the Lord of glory. And he said unto them, what's the first word? Say that again. Go. Go, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Let me read one more time. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Let's pray. Father, I pray in the minutes that we have together here, you'd speak to our hearts. I pray, Lord, somehow, your heart could be communicated to our hearts. That somehow we could just lay hold a little bit on what matters to you. I pray you'd speak to each person here. Lord, there's probably in a group this size, there's probably some people here who they've never really met you. They, they know about you maybe, but they've never met you. They've never been born again the Bible way. I pray, Father, that you'd speak to their heart and help them to understand your, your deep love for them, the love that brought you out of heaven and down to Calvary, that you might pay for their sin and for mine. I pray, Father, for each person here that's born again, that we recognize that our lives are not our own. We're bought with the price. That our lives, therefore, because we belong to you, ought to be yielded up to you, that we'd not be the servant of sin, but instead we would be those who would be given the righteousness. We'd go preaching the gospel to every single creature that needs Christ. Would you speak to our hearts here today? Would you lay hold of our hearts today? Would you cause us to have a heart for the people of this world like you do? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's one of the most amazing stories in all the world. In fact, we've heard it so many times, I think we sometimes get a little bit callous to it. We've just heard it so many times. The Lord of glory steps out of heaven. He comes to this earth as a babe in a manger. Not to be a babe forever, but to grow up so that he might die. Die on the cross of Calvary for your sins in your place and in mine. He prepared a group of men, some 12 men that he worked with. One of them betrayed him. He had 11 left. And those men forsook him as he got ready to go to the cross. He's been arrested. And they forsook him at his greatest time of need. They forsook him and walked away. Jesus has prepared those men to be entrusted with the responsibility of carrying the gospel to the rest of the world and establishing churches and reaching their generation in their day, every creature with the gospel of Christ. It's an amazing story for who in their, who in their right mind would ever leave the job of carrying the gospel, this, this glorious message in the hands of 11 men who were so cowardly that they ran away at the time of Jesus' greatest need. But that's what Jesus did. And we're going to see later tonight, Lord willing, we're going to see tonight that they do the job that they were given. It's an amazing story for how in the world could these men who forsake Christ, who, who have so little at their disposal, how could they get the job done? And yet they do get the job done. This is the thing that has challenged me so much is that if, if Jesus Christ would leave the job in the hands of men so uncommitted, so ill-prepared to take the step of, of the ultimate sacrifice of laying their own lives on the line, if He would leave it in their hands, should not I be preparing others also? And He's left it in my hands. But I should be leaving it in the hands of others so that they too are doing the same job. 
My job is not just to make sure that my family is saved and us four and no more kind of attitude, but instead my job with my life is that for the rest of my days, however many days God may give me, and He's given me far more days than I ever expected in life, but if He's going to give me these days, these days are to be invested for Jesus Christ. They do not belong to me. I have a, I have a calendar that hangs on my office door back in Africa. And on that calendar, I'm counting down the days. I know the number of days that are left until I reach 70. Now, if God gives me 70 day, 70 years, I'll be thrilled. If He gives me more, that'll be fine. And if I still have health and ability, I'm still going to use those days beyond 70. But I'm kind of using 70 as my target years of that's the days that I know, uh, I say I know, I, I hope, let's put it that way, that I will have enough strength and enough health, or hope, uh, enough health to be able to go and to carry the gospel to places beyond the shores of America. Now, I don't know. Once I hit 70, I, and maybe I won't even make 70. Maybe I won't even have the health up to 70. I don't know that. But right now, I've got fairly good health. And I expect, therefore, that if God is good to me, He'll let me have those years. I want to have every single day invested until I get to, get to heaven. Now, if I get to 70 and God says, you can have 80 years, ooh, that would be pretty good. And I hope that He gives me really good health for those, those years during the 70s. And I'll use those too. I, I am not going to squander them. I'm not going to waste them. I'm not going to throw them away. And if He lets me go to 90, I can't hardly imagine that. But if He lets me go that long, then okay, so be it. I pray that God gives me enough health to be able to do something for Him in my days that I have left. Every day should belong to Him. Now here's the marching orders that He gave to His disciples. Watch what He says. He says, go ye. The word go. What, what does go mean to you? When you hear the word go, what, what does that mean? Move. Move. In other words, don't sit still. We should be busy going. We should be busy operating. We should be acting. If I'm going to move, what happens? That means I pick up from where I am. It means that I go to a place where I need to get to. It means that I get my eyes on the needs that are out here in our world, that I look at people who are in need of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to be carrying the gospel. It's my job to be going. I need to go. The sad truth is that as I sit in America and I look overseas, I look at people with great need, and I realize that less than 10% of the full-time workers in America, less than 10% are outside the United States. 90% plus are working in the United States. And I meet young preachers all the time, and I look around. I was pastoring Lehigh. I had a comfortable church there. Some good people. They treated me well. They were good to me. And, and I'm looking around, and I'm saying, you know what? I could coast out my years right here and finish out my life. This would be okay. Be around my grandkids and all the rest. Well, most of them, part of them are over in South Africa, so couldn't be around all of them, no matter what I do, all right? But at the end of the day, I could finish out my life in, in Pennsylvania and, and just let it go right there. But as I looked around, I said, you know, there's all kinds of young preachers around. They've got all of them in vigor. They can get up and go do things. Why don't they just get up and why don't they go? Well, they're not going to go. Well, why don't we just let them go right here and I'll go over there? And that's kind of the thought that was in my mind for a number of years. And thus was born the saying that I often said to the church and told others, if God will give me a yellow light, I'm gone. No, I, I don't wait on green lights. I don't worry, you know, if it's, if it's not yet turned red, I can kind of scoot through yellows, okay? And uh, this is kind of how I drive it. Maybe that's why I moved to South Africa, because that's how we drive over there. And so I feel a lot more comfortable over there. You'll get a ticket here, but over there, I can slide right through. In fact, I can sneak through at the beginning of a red light and still make it and everything's okay. I really feel good over there, all right? <laughs> but he says, go. Now, go for you doesn't necessarily mean go overseas. It doesn't necessarily mean that you've got to go to another state or another city. But what it does mean is we need to be on the go. We need to, we need to have this mindset, if you will, that we have a job. We have a task. 
And it's not just my task as a missionary. It's not just your pastor's task as a pastor. It is our task. It is your task. And thus comes this word ye. Y-E. The word ye in your King James Bible, and this is one of the reasons I love the King James Bible so much, is because the King James Bible is very careful with the text. The word ye and the word you are always plural words. It's like they say down south, y'all. And when they're saying y'all, they mean all of you in particular. Each of you, but all of you as a group. Okay? Paul sometimes said that over the book of Romans. He used the term you all. That kind of gets me because I'm not a southerner. But anyway, uh, once in a while I, I defer to my southern friends and I'm kind to them anyway. But anyway, they sometimes need to be rubbed a little bit. So if there's any southerners, come see me afterwards. Maybe I'll give you a hard time and we'll both be happy, okay? But ye, he says ye. He's talking about plural, all of you together as a group. But individually, you also have this responsibility to be going. So could I ask you the question this morning, where are you going and to whom are you going? No, I'm not asking you, are you going overseas? I'm, I'm asking you, to whom are you going? What people are you going to? What specific people are you going to? I, I honestly believe that as Christians, what we ought to have is we ought to just have ourselves a whole list of some people that we are actively praying for and actively going to in order to do what Jesus said. Go ye therefore, or go ye, let's read this, go ye into all the world. There we go. Alright, I've been working with Matthew 28, 19 this last week, y'all, all, all week long, so I was getting the therefore in there. Go ye into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel. Now the word preach is an interesting word. The word preach has the idea of making an announcement. It's what a it's what a uh, a servant of a king would do when a king was getting ready to go into a city. And he wanted all the subjects to be lined up. He would send a, an advance man in, and the advance man would stand in the town square and blow his trumpet. He would gather the people, and then he would make the announcement, in the name of the king, I am announcing to you, this is what's going to happen, and this is what you need to do. That's exactly what we do with the gospel of Jesus Christ, is we go and we announce the gospel. But when I go over to Africa and I talk to people about the gospel, I get people who stand up and they, they almost salute. I mean, they love the term gospel. Gospel, I, this is one of the reasons I like Africa, is because down where I'm working, if they see a Bible, they honor a Bible. It doesn't matter if they're Muslim, they still honor the Bible. It doesn't matter what religion they are, they still honor the Bible. It doesn't matter if they don't have a religion, they honor the Bible. You talk to them about the gospel, you talk to them about Jesus, oh yes, I believe in the gospel, I believe in Jesus. And so I usually ask them this question. Could you obey a commandment if you didn't know what the commandment was? Could you obey a commandment if you did not know what the commandment was? And their answer is always, well, of course not. I have to know what the commandment is before I can obey it. So I ask them to do what I'm going to ask you to do. Turn over to the book of 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1. I want you to see this. Because this is what our job is, is to go and, and to announce, to preach this gospel to people. Here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and verse number 8, the Bible says, speaking about Jesus Christ, who is going to be revealed from heaven, He will come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now here's what's going to happen. There's going to be a day when every person on planet earth is going to face Almighty God. And those who have not obeyed the gospel are going to be put in everlasting punishment. The gospel is the key the gospel message is what needs to be announced. It needs to be preached. It's not something to debate. It is something to announce to people. This is what the God of heaven has sent to this world in order to keep people out of everlasting punishment. But if people do not know what that gospel is, they cannot obey it. So I then ask this question. Since you cannot obey a command if you do not know what the command is, this command is obey the gospel. Do you know what the gospel is? And most of them will say, well, of course I know what the gospel is. And 
probably many Americans would say the same thing. Almost everybody will say, well, yeah, I know what the gospel is. Okay, good. What is the gospel then? Now we get all kinds of answers. The Bible, that's a common answer. The Bible is the gospel. And my answer to that is, the gospel is in the Bible, but the Bible is not the gospel. The gospel is contained in the Bible. So what is this gospel? And then they'll answer, well, the gospel is Jesus Christ. Well, you're getting a little warmer because Jesus has to do with this gospel. He's, he is the central person of this gospel, but the gospel is not Jesus. Well, the gospel would be baptism then, sometimes they'll say. Well, that's an interesting statement, but nowhere in the Bible will you say that, see that baptism has anything to do with the gospel except as a picture of what that gospel is. So what is the gospel? Uh, it's in the Word of God. No. That's a great guess, and many of the Africans would say exactly that. That's exactly what my answer would have been. What is the gospel? Turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians. I'm going to give you the definition of the gospel according to the Word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Many of, the, many of the Africans believe, especially this is true in Botswana, it's especially true there, even more so than South Africa, they believe that the Ten Commandments are how we get to heaven, by keeping them. But the problem with that is, when you begin to think about the Ten Commandments, for instance, have you ever stolen anything? Hmm. Ever taken anything one time in your life, a piece of paper, a paper clip, a, a pencil, a pen? Yeah, I have. So what do you call me if I've stolen something? You call me a thief. That's not very kind. But it's very true, isn't it? How many times do you have to steal something to be a thief? Once. Have you ever told a lie? Have you ever tried to mislead somebody by telling them part of the truth but not all the truth? That's a lie. Have you ever told a lie? You ever tell a lie when you're growing up as a child? Your mother, did you do? No, no, not me, Mom. Yeah, right. But she has eyes in the back of her head, and she knew you did it, right? What do you call somebody that lies? A liar. Wow. And we begin asking these questions to uncover for people the fact that the people in Africa are just like me. They're liars, they're thieves. Yes, the seventh commandment. Have you ever committed adultery? Now, don't answer that, okay? But many people say, oh no, not me. Well, over in Africa, most of the people say, well, yeah, me, because that is a culture that's there. And I'll say to them, well, you know what? I've never been with anybody but my wife. She's the only one I've ever been with. Oh, then you're safe. No, I'm not safe. Because you know what Jesus said about adultery? Jesus said, if you look on a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. Have you ever looked on someone with lust in your heart? With sexual desire in your heart? If that's true, and I don't think it's untrue of anybody because all of us here are liars. So if you tell me no, I'm going to tell you, well, we already know you're a liar, so I don't believe you, all right? Sorry. But the truth is, you've looked on someone with lust in your heart. Now, I've had, I've had sodomites say to me, well, I've never looked on a woman with lust, so I haven't done that. Oh, have you ever looked on a man? And so he says, oh, boy, that's, that's horrible. Would you, would you tell a sodomite that they're in trouble because they're a sodomite? Yeah, and I'd tell heterosexuals they're in trouble because of the adulterous heart that they've got as well. We're all in trouble with Almighty God. We've all broken His law. I can't get to heaven by being good enough. I can't keep enough laws because I've already broken the law so many times. I'm in trouble with God. I've offended Almighty God and I deserve hell. That's the world that we live in. I deserve everlasting punishment. But watch what it says in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're trying to figure out what is the gospel then. The word gospel means good news. Paul writes and he says in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Here is the gospel. The word gospel means good news. Here's the good news. What's the good news? This is the good news which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. 
This is what sets you free. Here we go. Verse 2. By which also you are saved. There's a good Bible word. Do you want to be saved? Do you want to be saved from the sin? Do you want to be saved from the penalty of your sin? By which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you. What did he preach unto them? He preached the gospel. We're going to find out what it is. Which, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Now watch verse 3. Here we go. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Paul, what did you receive? He received the gospel. What was that gospel? Here it is. That which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. Now, if you'd asked me, growing up, if you'd asked me, growing up in the church I grew up in, uh, do you know that Jesus died? I'd say yes. Why did Jesus die? Well, He died for us. He died for our sins. Okay, no big deal. But it is a big deal. Because what hit me eventually as I sat underneath the preaching of the Word of God was I, I realized that this is a very personal issue. I'm the one who lied. I'm the one who stole. I'm the one with the adulterous heart. I'm the one who dishonored parents. I'm the one who dishonored God. I'm the one who didn't put Christ first. I am the one who has, has broken the Sabbath. I am the one. I am the one who has taken God's name in vain. I am the one who has coveted. I am the one who has condemned. I deserve hell fire. I deserve everlasting punishment. And I don't like that news. But like most people in our world, what I would have very simply said to you is, wait, 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 wait. I'm not all that bad. Come on. After all, haven't you done the same thing? We're all the same. We're all sinners. So what's the big deal? Surely God's got a, a, a he'll grade on a curve a little bit, right? Not according to the Word of God. Be ye therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. How perfect is God? He's not grading on a curve. I'm in trouble with Almighty God because of my sin. I deserve judgment. I deserve hell. My only hope is that somehow that payment can be made, a payment can be made to pay for my sin so that I don't have to pay for that sin. That's the hope that I would then want. That's exactly what the gospel is all about. Christ died for our sins. Jesus Christ, when He went to the cross of Calvary, He didn't go there to die for Himself. He didn't need to die. He had not committed any sin. He didn't deserve death. He went to, to that cross for you and for me. He went there to pay for my sins. And when that came crushing down upon me that day, as I began to understand it in 1971, I began to realize my soul, He died for me. The King of glory, the God of heaven, came into this world to die on that cross to pay for my sin. Why would He love me like that? And my heart was crushed. And then He says, He died for our sins according to the Scriptures, which is talking about his death was a fulfillment of prophecy so that when I look at the death of Jesus Christ, I can check it out and say, okay, there have been thousands and millions of people that have died before. What makes the death of Jesus any different? I'll tell you what makes the death of Jesus different. His very coming, the way He lived, what He did, how He died, and the 30-some prophecies that were fulfilled during that period of His death and crucifixion, all those prophecies that were fulfilled. How many of you are able to predict your birth and where it's going to be before you're born? Anybody? Why not? You weren't here, were you? How could you ever predict your coming birth before you're born if you didn't exist? Impossible. But Jesus did. How could He do such a thing? Well, that's pretty simple. He is God. He existed before He came in Bethlehem. And how many of you could actually write out prophecy after prophecy of, of your coming, of where you would live as a child, what would happen as a child, what would happen during your earthly life, how you would be betrayed and who would betray you, and what, he, what price he would get for betraying you. 
and then how you would be killed and the death that you were going to die, this prophecy being prophesied long before you, you would even come into the world, but these prophecies, and you keep all these prophecies, fulfill them, you, you perfectly fulfill every single one. You die on the cross, and now here's, here's the kicker. Here is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and He was buried. Notice what it says now in verse number 4. It says, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. How many of you could then raise from the dead after you died? How many of you know anybody who did that besides Jesus? There's not one. Now, you've got one or two choices at this point. You can say, okay, he didn't really raise from the dead. This is a myth. This is a, a folk tale that, you know, has been passed down. Or you can look at the evidence and say, this is a better attested miracle in the Bible, his resurrection, a better attested miracle than the fact that George Washington lived. There's more historical proof that Jesus rose from the dead than George Washington lived. Do you believe George Washington lived? What about Abraham Lincoln? More historical proof that Jesus rose from the dead than that Abraham Lincoln lived. I don't know anybody would question that fact. At least anybody in their right mind, all right? But Jesus rose from the dead, which proves to us that He really did have the sanction of the Father and the death of Jesus Christ paid for the sins of the people that He was dying for. So we come to this Gospel and Jesus says, the people that are going to be judged, the people that will be be condemned to everlasting punishment and hell fire are going to be the people that do not obey the gospel. The gospel is the good news. What is the good news? The good news is that God came out of heaven, died for your sins to pay for your sins so that you can be set free from that life of sin and belong to the God of heaven. That's the good news. Jesus Christ has accomplished that for you and now you must respond to that message in the right way. You must obey that message. And the proper response is repentance and faith. And I don't have time to go into all that this morning. But what that message does is what it's done for multitudes here in America, for multitudes through the centuries, and for many of the people that we have dealt with over in, in Botswana and now in South Africa, who when they come to Jesus Christ, they are set free from their sin life. They are set free from being captives to this servant servanthood of sin, they are set free from that and all of a sudden they can set the bottle down and they can live a life as a human being that God has made to reflect His image. They can go around reflecting the image of God. They can go about telling others of Jesus Christ, reproducing people who become like the Lord Jesus Christ. That becomes their life. They become people who look like Christ, act like Christ, live like Christ. Their lives are transformed. Their families are transformed. Their relationships are transformed. And in turn, they go around telling other people about Christ. And those people's lives are then given hope when they hear the message, not this person changed, but when they hear the message, Jesus Christ can change lives and He can change yours. The stories I told you this morning in Sunday school are not just the stories of some African people and those poor bad African people really need it. The stories I told you are people who come from the same common stock as you and I do. They come from Noah. Noah is our common parent. And Adam. Adam is our common parent. And I don't care what color your skin is. I don't care whether you're white or black or red or yellow. It doesn't make any difference. We all have the same common parents. We come out of Adam. And we are all related whether we like it or not. And we are all headed to the same place whether we like it or not. And that's hell. Unless we obey the gospel. And nobody can obey the gospel until they hear that gospel. And that's why missionaries go. And that's why you need to go. And that's why people outside these doors need to hear. Because even though they may know the term gospel, they probably do not know what that gospel is all about. And if you know that answer, you owe it to them to spend the rest of your life taking the gospel, the good news that Jesus died for their sins to set them free, to those people so that they can make a decision about whether or not they will obey that gospel. Father, thank you for meeting with us.
Thank you for the name.